Hey guys, Moidog here, and today I've got some more exciting news about Foxhole Inferno, the official 1.0 update to the game, and it comes from the latest dev blog. As y'all know, we were able to get a sneak peek of most of the features coming to the game later this month, but there were some placeholder items, some stuff wasn't really ready for us to play around with, and other things were just simply not finished. It was a fantastic time to play around with the new facilities and tanks, but it was essentially a tiny little play area, and nothing was really tested. Today, however, is the release of Foxhole's dev branch, a special early playtesting branch of the new version of Foxhole. Leading up to the opening of the dev branch was the most recent dev blog, and here the dev stated what we should expect from the update, and they broke it up into three main sections. Facilities, trains, and fire. They expanded on a few areas that a lot of us had questions on during the dev chat and also some things that we didn't even see during the dev early preview. So this dev blog has a lot of good information as we go into a testing phase before 1.0 officially releases. But before we dive into that, I do want to remind everyone that I'll be streaming the dev branch when it goes live on September 13th up until Foxhole Inferno officially drops on September 28th all on Twitch. And once that does go live, we'll be doing the war 24 seven. So come hang out, see the new stuff, ask questions, and then of course, come hang out with us during the war. Okay, so starting off, facilities are arguably the biggest changes to Foxhole. And the devs stated that they are supposed to give Logi players a goal, a way to progress through a kind of logistics tech tree, if you will. And not only will those who love logistics be able to progress and get to in-game stretch goals, but they will create strategic targets for the enemy as well, such as raiding an enemy tank facility, or even coastal bombardment of enemy ports. This introduces a completely new gameplay loop, and if you progress properly, some things will even be able to become fairly automated, so you won't have to personally scrap salvage fields, for example. And there are also ways to increase your efficiency and streamline your industrial facilities, not unlike other factory games like Factorio. It is clarified, however, that the Logi Towns and the usual means to produce material through refineries and factories are not going away. You'll be essentially working in in tandem with these backline facilities as well as the backline logi towns in order to get material up to your midlines and of course your front lines. The biggest change, however, is that vehicle variants will not be bound to the tech tree, and they will not be able to be built in Logi Towns. This is a huge change, and it means that in order to get a Spatha, for example, you have to produce a Falchion, or the mass production tank, in the back line, and then transport that Falchion to an assembly area in order to install the modifications at the vehicle assembly spot to make it a Spatha. The same would go for turning a Hatchet into a Kroneska, or an Outlaw into the new Bone. Own law. The devs state that they hope this creates an added depth to production where certain regions may be more specialized in making certain vehicles than others, therefore creating large strategic targets like knocking out the Spatha factory or perhaps the Silverhand factory. They did mention a little bit about tweaking the resources needed for these base variants so it's not completely crazy when you get to the upgrades, but we really have no idea until we get to those parts of the tech tree. Additionally, the new modification center is balanced in such a way that hopefully you won't be able to spam incredibly overpowered tanks like you could in past wars, and instead, you will need to see if it's actually worth the resource sink. Still, the devs are pretty keen on this being a great new way for vehicle modifications, but it really needs players to test and see what works and what doesn't. And although I'm really excited to see this in action, it is a huge fundamental change in the way that vehicle production is managed. Now, apart from vehicle modifications, facilities will also be able to produce the following. Sandbags, barbed wire, and metal beams, refined resources like concrete and petrol, battle tanks and super heavy tanks, artillery shells like 120mm and 150mm rounds, and also heavy ammo including the new flame fuel, 94.5 and 75mm, as well as logistics equipment like stationary cranes, stationary harvesters, pipes, minecarts, and trains. Now many people have been asking why can't facilities produce everything? And the real reason appears to be that Logi Balance may get so out of whack with facilities that iterative updates would actually be better. As the devs write, allowing any item to be produced at a player-built facility has the potential to undermine the supply line game, which is central to the ecosystem, but they would like to learn how this version is received and expand further in the future. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if later next year, after the devs have been able to see this over the course of a few wars and different ways that it's worked, that we will actually be able to produce things like 
762 or shirts or bandages, whatever you could do at a factory at a player built facility. But we just need to figure out the right balance and the devs need to figure out the right flow so it doesn't get crazy. The worst thing to do is provide way too many things so that way fronts just never die. There needs to be a little bit of scarcity for this game to actually be good. Now, another big gameplay change related to facilities is a complete rebalancing of fuel. Salvage, sulfur, and component mines now need significantly less fuel to run, meaning that you should be able to have these mines fueled and running without worrying about them for a much longer period of time, which is awesome since it's incredibly frustrating to take a look at backline mines, only to see nearly every single one is not only out of fuel, but also empty of resources. Because of this change, vehicles have also had their fuel consumption cut by 50%. Or put another way, vehicles can now drive twice as far on one tank of gas. This is a really nice quality of life change, especially for tanks like the Widow, which are notoriously huge gas guzzlers. Also with the new oil refineries, petrol should actually be a lot more prevalent, and we may see vehicles come to use petrol instead of diesel as their main means of fuel, which would be a really interesting game mechanic, especially if perhaps one region has a much better petrol refining process than the other. So you could have entire areas of the map that simply run on petrol, while other hexes run on diesel. Apart from fuel, bunkers and pallets are also getting a rework as well. Pallets are now the intended method of delivering bulk items to the front, and the devs have stated that large items like 120, 150, 250, and 300 millimeter ammo are able to be stored on pallets. But on the dev branch, I even saw things like tripods and lamentums, so expect a whole host of new ways to transport items. However, with this change is the removal of a beloved piece of logistics equipment, the small shipping container. The small shipping container is the go-to for supplying faraway hexes with up to 40 crates of whatever you need, usually B-Mass or other critical items. And although I love the new pallet system, I'm really concerned about the loss of the small shipping container. Unless rail is routed to far off relics and bases, I'm really curious to see how these areas will survive now cut off from Lodgy for so much time. And any experienced player knows how effective a couple of well-timed small shipping container deliveries can be. I'm still really not sold on this one change, but we'll see. Bunkers are also getting a new surprise change, and they will actually require barbed wire, sandbags, and metal beams instead of basic materials as they used to. This is confusing, exciting, it's weird. I both hate it and I love it. I don't really know what to think about this one, and I'm guessing that this sentence here means that certain bunker upgrades specifically that require sandbags, barbed wire, or metal beams when you actually place them and see them, like adding razor wire to the top of a trench, using metal beams for trench bridges, or sandbags for, well, the sandbags, I think these things will actually have to use those materials instead of right now where it uses anywhere from 10 to 50 B mats. Requiring all of these new items will require facilities to be constantly pumping out materials, and as a new way to receive them, bunkers will actually have a new stockpile area called the storage room, replacing older ammunition rooms. Here, you can store tripods and tripod weapons weapons, which, if you were looking closely at the picture here, you'd notice an intimidatingly large stack of lamentums all lined up along the back wall, as well as the other sandbags and materials in addition to the large artillery shells. As much as I like the new storage rooms, I really hope that these new mechanics feel like they flow, since at face value, transferring pallets of things like metal beams to a bunker base, and then store it inside of a storage room, and then pull them in order to build a defensive bunker piece seems kind of clunky without really having any fun gameplay interactions, so I really just need to see this truly implemented. Moving on to trains, the devs did clarify that train tracks can be placed anywhere in the world, including over ditches and on bridges, as long as they can overcome landscape obstacles. They're snappable, not unlike when you build walls, and when you build a fork in the tracks, you'll also automatically spawn in a switch that you can use to change the train's direction. In 1.0, we'll be getting the following tracks. Normal railway tracks, which are used for the large locomotives and their train cars, small gauge railway tracks used for minecarts, and crane railway tracks. Special tracks used exclusively for the heavy rail crane that you can find at facilities and ports. However, you won't have to build everything yourself. Some areas of the game will have tracks pre-built that you can link up to, and these are primarily to help trains get through hard-to-pass places and rivers. You'll also be able to connect trains across regions, and tracks built next to the border will be immune from rapid decay, and players will also not be blocked from traveling region to region. Yes, let me say that again. Players will not be stuck in queue traveling from region to region 
happen when they're in a train. And an amazing thing here, since being partisaned in a 15 car train with a load of tanks would be absolutely infuriating. Smaller train cars will have up to four cars behind them, and the full size locomotives will be able to pull 15 to 20 cars, with the final number dependent on playtesting over the next few weeks. Additionally, the devs did state that although the smaller minecarts will be available pretty early on in the war, the larger full size trains will come online around mid war, and that these are quote unquote mountain goals for Logi players and will require significant facility development, cooperation, time, and resources to produce. I really like this, and it gives Logi a goal not unlike a build and their storm cannon base. Oh, and another piece of key information from the devs, your train will not be stopped by a bicycle. Supposedly, trains will be able to damage and destroy smaller vehicles like bikes and trucks, but larger vehicles like tanks won't get damaged. I'd still like to see if there's any physics going to be implemented in the future, since if a small light tank were to just simply park on the tracks, a full 15 car locomotive going full speed slamming into it would do a lot of damage. Fingers crossed, but just stopping dead on the rails from one little tank might be a bit of a bummer. Now, to wrap the dev block up, the last part covers fire, and the devs clarified that fire will do damage over time, to an extent. Once the structure is on fire, it must be sustained and grown by the fire that's causing it or an additional thing like an incendiary rocket or flamethrower, and if left alone, the fire will actually eventually just settle out on its own. I'm guessing allowing fires to just die out is to prevent one arsonist just going around and torching down half the map with no QRF. And although fire might not actually do that in the real world, I think that's a fine gameplay balance thing. It really would be kind of horrible if you were to log on for the day and see that one simple partisan burned down a week's worth of work all because nobody came out to put a small blaze. Fire now will also act with the environment and can spread between structures as well as be put out by rain and snow. You can even use the fire to thaw out vehicles in addition to damaging lighter ones. And if you catch fire, well, just have someone throw some water on you or hop into a river or lake to put it out. I really can't wait to see fire in the real war, and I think it will be a great force multiplier for a side if you have a few flamethrowers or incendiary rockets. Being able to clear towns and buildings and start blazes that must be dealt with by defenders will be incredibly fun and chaotic. Lastly, the devs did say that unfortunately quite a few fun things were cut in order to hit their deadlines of September 28th. We don't know what has been cut, but one thing that we are getting is a brand new rocket artillery emplacement, and you can see the colonial version in some art here. The dev stated that we're actually getting this one specifically because it's an important balance role, and my guess is that these emplacements will be the exact opposites to the mobile artillery, since right now the colonial rocket trucks can only fire high explosive rockets, while the warden rocket half track can only fire incendiary rockets. My guess is that these emplacements are actually flipped, since only having one side with the actual fire incendiary rockets would be a pretty bad balance take if fire is going to be this powerful. Overall, after reading this dev blog and getting ready for the dev branch, I am excited. And the dev branch is officially releasing today, September 13th, and will run through September 21st. The caveat? It's actually going to be developing in stages, and there's no shortcuts on technology. Since resources and logistics have so many many things changing, the devs are actually asking players to start from scratch in order to see how we can interact with the new facilities mechanics and to actually see how we build from the ground up. I both love and hate this, and it's true that the only way we can actually test facilities is by starting from scratch, but I know a lot of people simply don't care about logistics and are going to be bummed out that they can't instantly drive around and test out the new battle tanks. Still, I'll be out in the back and midlines testing out some facilities and getting my Fox Torio on, so I won't be be complaining. But what do you guys think? Still hype for facilities? Are you concerned at all about the new bunker supply and pallet system? Or are you just excited to get a rail network up and running? Let me know in the comments below and if you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more. But that's it for me. Until next time, peace.